Thank you, Elders Grouse and Pamela Barnes, and welcome to everyone who is joining us for the recording of this event. A reminder that closed captioning is now available. If you would like to use this service, please click the CC icon on the bottom of your screen. My name is Melissa Petorka, and I'm joining you today from the traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee's people. I work and study at the University of Waterloo, which is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations. My work at Waterloo is to support action around our institution's commitments to the Okanagan Charter, an international charter for health promoting universities and colleges. I also have the honor of serving as the co-chair of the Canadian Health Promoting Campuses Network with my colleague, Matt Dolph from UBC. This network has been working together since 2016 to engage higher education institutions in the health promoting universities and colleges movement. To date, 30 campuses in Canada have officially adopted the Okanagan Charter. Created in 2015, the transformative vision of the Okanagan Charter is more pertinent now than ever as we face several interconnected global crises, including colonialism, COVID-19 and its secondary impacts, systemic racism, and climate change. The charter calls for higher education to transform the health and sustainability of our current and future societies, strengthen communities, and contribute to the well-being of people, places, and the planet. It provides us with a common language, principles, and framework to address these pressing systemic issues by embedding health into everyday operations, business practices, and academic mandates. The Charter focuses on creating campus cultures of compassion, well-being, equity, and social justice. And these commitments aim to improve the health of the people who live, learn, work, play, and love on our campuses and strengthen the ecological, social, and economic sustainability of our communities and wider society. While the Okanagan Charter has principles that speak to the importance of Indigenous communities' contexts and priorities, perspectives and experiences, there is still much to learn and be done to truly center Indigenous communities' history, culture, traditions, values, and knowledge in health promotion and well-being. And that's what brings us together today. In our collective efforts to enact the Okanagan Charter, it is essential that we advocate to align these actions to strengthen institutional commitments to indigenization rather than detract, to convene conversations with various levels of leadership to center indigenous engagement, transform the teaching and learning environments that center indigenous worldviews while addressing how colonialism has historically and currently oppresses, excludes, and harms Indigenous peoples. And finally, to structure this work in a way that focuses less on one-off or individual actions and in instead takes a systems approach to shifting policy, culture, and ultimately societal change. And I want to emphasize this last point around a whole systems approach, a very important strength of the Okanagan Charter. When I first began working with the Charter, I was introduced to an analogy for a whole systems approach that has always stuck with me. This comes from Dan Rice at University of Victoria. Dan said, if the frogs in the pond started behaving strangely, our first reaction would not be to punish them or even to treat them. Instinctively, we'd wonder, what is going on in the pond? When we as institutions commit to the Okanagan Charter, we're promising to change our ponds. The ponds of higher education have been built on colonialism. To enact the Okanagan Charter, we must first critically assess how colonialism is at play. The ponds of our institution are structured to normalize racism and resist efforts to decolonize. As Marsha J. Anderson questions, who are the people we oppress through policy choices and discourses of racial inferiority? And on the flip side, who stands to benefit? I have experienced many privileges in higher education that I have not earned simply based on my identity and social position. 
These unearned advantages often go unseen. These systems perpetuate inequities and therefore must be addressed to make meaningful change. The time has long passed for higher education to work collectively on indigenization and the truth and reconciliation calls to action. Commitments to the Okanagan Charter represents an important opportunity to center the voices and experiences of Indigenous students, staff, and faculty. On behalf of the Canadian Health Promoting Campuses Network, I would like to emphasize that today is only the beginning. Our network has deep gratitude for the Indigenous leaders and student speakers who will share with us today. And we want to honor their words by taking action based on what is heard. Many hands went into the creation of this event, and I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge all contributors. The UBC Office of Indigenous Strategic Initiatives, UBC Indigenous Initiatives, the Waterloo Indigenous Student Center, University of Waterloo Indigenous Initiatives Office, McGill First People's House, Dalhousie Indigenous Health Interest Group, the, Wellbeing, the UBC Wellbeing Office, University of Waterloo Health Promotion, McGill Student Wellness Hub and Student Services, and the Canadian Health Promoting Campuses Network. Our network is a truly collaborative community where we believe that our action is strengthened through our collective and diverse knowledge, experiences, and resources. Working together to host this event is one example of the collaboration and synergies surrounding the Okanagan Charter, and we look forward to continuing this work with you. It is now my great pleasure to turn it over to Mark Solomon. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. That was amazing. What a great, uh, what a great opening. Uh, thank you to Pamela and Elder Gross and, and acknowledging uh, Elder Elaine Gardner is here as well. Um, always nice to have the elders here. And uh, also super, super nice. We have four Indigenous youth that are gonna walk us through some questions. Um, and so what I'll do is maybe we'll start off with a, uh, an easy softball question. We were talking about how all nervous we are because we got so many people from coast to coast here, but we're gonna do great. Um, so let's do this. Uh, we'll start off with um, um, what does well-meaning mean to you uh, for, our, for our panelists? And if you could introduce yourself and uh, who you is and uh, where you're calling in from, that would be super amazing. So what, what does well-meaning mean for you? Not all at once. I can go first. So what well-being means to me, it's kind of like what the, um, the medicine you know, means to indigenous people. So it's the combination of um, mental, physical, spiritual, and emotional aspects that all interact with each other and create wellness. So when we try to improve wellness, we try to integrate all these different parts of our lives and try to, I guess, try to optimize in the way that we feel comfortable to create the ideal amount of wellness that we want. Other thoughts? Yeah. I can hop in there. Um, so um, my name is Veruca. I am a um, JD student, a law student here at UBC. Um, I am a Cree um, Métis student coming from Samson Cree Nation in Treaty 6. Just a quick introduction. Um, well-being to me is a very holistic thing that's in individualized and um, people experience well-being in, in very different ways. And I think that Indigenous peoples experience it in a, uh, a very specific, but also um, unique way. Um, and I think that for me personally, coming from where I come from, an important aspect of my well-being is um, that I keep in mind as I carry myself walking this earth is how I connect myself with my territories and how I connect to my ancestors. And I, I carry that thought with me um, and in a way that's reciprocal and um, embodies reciprocity. And I think that when I give um, and I, I also always return, I always get in return and that um, is a way that makes me feel really good. Hi, I'll go next. My name is Cheryl Thompson and I'm Cree and Métis. I'm a student of Simon Fraser University and I currently live and raise my family on the unceded territory of Kitsi First Nation. And to me, 
wellness is not just a sense of what everyone else has said, because I, I echo your sentiments, but this ability to walk in a way that is true to myself and true, true to how I want to live in this world and not having to conform necessarily to what's in existence here for us, but also creating that space for my family and my children to be able to exist as who they are as they walk their journey here as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Savannah Seaton. Um, I'm zooming in today from um, Waterloo, Ontario, uh, the traditional territory of the Atawandran Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, as was already previously shared, it's um, the University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Tract and six miles on uh, both sides of the Grand River were promised to the Six Nations back in 1784. So that's where I'm zooming in from today. Um, I am Anishinaabe Plains Ojibwe from Weiwei Skabo and Kisikunin in Manitoba. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I share a lot of the same sentiments about what well-being is. I feel, um, you know, I can get caught up with all the things I need to do to be well instead of just being myself and um, listening to myself. And, um, you know, for me, it has a lot to do with family. And if my family is doing well, I'm doing well. So I, I look at the people closest to me, my son, um, my mother, my sister, my brother. Um, and if they're not doing well, there's still work to be done. Um, and, uh, and that's it on a grand scale. And then there's the day-to-day well-being, right? And, um, and that I think is, can be a lot harder to, to manage, but at the same time, um, you know, anything can kind of set you off if you're going into these institutions and into these realms where you've, you've worked on yourself so much, but then you're, you know, you're in a state of being triggered almost um, from having feelings come up over and over again from similar things being shared over and over again in these, in these settings. So um, yeah, for me, that's, I think, where well-being starts. So there's different degrees, there's different stages. It depends on where you're at in your journey. Um, yeah, so I'll just leave it at that. So good. Yasmin, I'm gonna give you one more uh, loop around to do an introduction of yourself. Okay, sounds good. So hi everyone, my name is Yasmin Boardman. I'm, I'm a research assistant at UBC for Indigenous wellness, mental health and physical health. And also I'm coming in from Vancouver on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Seattle. Amazing, amazing. Um, okay, so in talking to all of you uh, in, in answering the question, well-being seems to be an individual process about identity, where you find yourself, who you are. How, as an institution, does it support or not support, sorry, an education institution? How does your education institution or one that you've attended or been, how do they support, maybe detract? Anyone want to take that one up first? I'll start a little bit with what SFU is doing. Um, because they're trying really hard. We have space created for us, safe spaces created for us, both at the institution and then within a few of the individual faculties. So my faculty of health, we have our own indigenous study space and a support person on staff who we can go to. But more broadly, the university has uh, stepped up with after the uh, the ARC report, the Aboriginal Reconciliation report came out, they've really tried to embrace the needs of Indigenous learners and create additional spaces. And now with the building of our own um, First Peoples House, uh, big, beginning construction. So they are trying to create space on the positive side. And I'll let maybe some positives go first before we tackle some of the challenges. Yeah, that's fair, Cheryl. So let's, yeah, so let's do that. We'll split into the positives and then we can talk about where 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 uh, where there's some opportunities for us to learn and to move on. Where are we here? Yeah, so I'll jump, I'll jump in here. Um, so, you know, I have, a, I have some experience at a few different institutions. I I got my undergrad in business management at Vancouver Island University, and they have a lovely center, and um, it was very inclusive and and um, you know, and I feel like they were definitely ahead of the game 
um, in terms of just acknowledgement throughout the campus and um, being sensitive in the classrooms um, and having Indigenous programming uh, available to students as well, an Indigenous studies program, for example. Um, so my experience there was fantastic. Um, I also had some experience working um, with the University of Victoria where they had um, weekly events, they had elders and residents every day, you know, you know, a certain day on the week, we would know when an elder would be there and, and it would be the same elder for a month or so, and then it would rotate to another local elder. And so it helped kind of bridge the gap for us students to um, connect with the local community if we were uh, visitors to the land. And, um, and then all the events associated with, you know, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, you know, there was um, the sharing circles for the, when the residential school survivors were sharing. Um, we had a, an event and a walk through campus and, um, you know, there's an Indigenous language revitalization program there, Indigenous governance. It's just, they're really, um, I feel like when we're talking about the positives among campuses and institutions, we can really, learn from one another um because you know i also had some experience at university of british columbia um did some work with them there and they have a beautiful center as well and um you know and the just the protocols and the way that events are are delivered is um is fantastic and authentic and it puts indigenous peoples first so um it's not an afterthought or a you know a sliding in wherever it fits. Um, and then moving out to Ontario for my master's here, I'm um, doing a master's in Indi industrial organizational psychology at University of Waterloo. It was a little bit like going back in time. And um, there is an Indigenous student centre here. We have Soup and Bannock once a week. There are um, Indigenous speaker series, you know, but um, there's the support is a little bit more challenging the the demographics are are, are smaller numbers so um, you know I think that's pretty normal but it shouldn't be that if we don't have the numbers of indigenous students that that um, dictates how much support or space is available for indigenous students um, to be attracted to the institution and want to uh, go to school so yes those are some of the positives. Um, as a, a student here at UBC, my journey um, to, to where I am now is, uh, I haven't, I didn't start here. I started at a college in Vancouver called Langara. Um, and I found that uh, at Langara, that the space that they made for Indigenous students was amazing. Um, they had the faculty and the staff in the Indigenous department, the Indigenous Studies department, all situated within each other. They had a big room for Indigenous students with a kitchen and an elder coming in bringing us bannock and making jam with us and um, we would have all the faculty the professors and we would all share the same space and I found that that was an amazing way to build a community and to, to keep supports up when students needed it there was a lot of tragedies that happened at the school during the time that I was there and being able to see students really be supported by our faculty by our, uh, the staff and the community there was uh, something I, I, I long to see here at UBC um, that being said, UBC has, you know, made strides as well. Um, I started my undergrad here and now I'm at the law school. So the professional program I'm in is a little bit separated from UBC as a whole. Um, but UBC's, um, they did a really great job. Like Savannah said, they have a great space down here. We have the Longhouse, which um, started a student collegia for all students um, from their first year of undergrad into their grad um, journey to connect with each other and build community. Uh, the law school specifically just started for the first time this year at UBC, um, an incoming um, Indigenous uh, class that they can take, uh, a law class for credits, for torts, for uh, people who don't know what that is, it's okay, but it's um, a, it's an amazing way that Allard as, a, as, a, as an institution has stepped up to support Indigenous students coming into uh, a professional program that um, is known to, to be very harmful at times. Um, and it's given students the opportunity to build connections and to build that community and that support system before they start full swing in September so that when these challenges arise with content and with other classmates and, um, you know, hard times come for our students that they have a place to fall back on and they have people that they know that they can trust to hold them up during times when things get hard. I can go next. 
what everyone said was great. And I can really, there's a lot of similarities at UBC also as Bruca noted. So at UBC, we also have a lot of amazing um, staff, faculty and indigenous advisors who really aim to promote indigenous well-being, especially due to COVID, there was a lot of incoming mental health concerns, well-being concerns, and a lot of new coming indigenous students who didn't know how to navigate those spaces. And a lot of indigenous advisors and indigenous staff or just other um, faculty and staff who are interested in promoting indigenous wellness, they also took, they also stepped up and really tried to promote wellness for students, especially for indigenous students, which was really great. And also that we have um, Move UBC and Thrive, which are cross campus initiatives at UBC, where we try to, I guess, improve overall physical health, mental health and overall wellness. And through these discussions, we have events and, and um, we try to improve overall discussions regarding wellness. And so these are, I guess, these are kind of vehicles to improve these, improve Indigenous wellness for students. That's great. So what's not working? What's not working on campuses? And uh, you don't feel like you have to call out your institution, but but what's not working? What, like what's uh, where 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 are we falling down? Where can we learn? What are some of the bumps in the road uh, or walls in the road that we need to talk about? I, I think that some of the challenges, and as a panel, we've had a bit of a conversation about this. Is this idea that classrooms are not always safe for us to attend, and not safe for us in ways I think that settlers understand. So when you walk into a classroom and you're the only Indigenous person and all eyes fall to you if there's ever a question, well, I cannot answer for any other nation. I can't even answer for my own nation. I can just answer for myself as an Indigenous person walking my path and my reality. And we're expected to somehow answer for everyone a question that we couldn't possibly know an answer to. And it, it's really challenging. So that's just the small bit. That, that's the well-meaning challenges. But then there's the racism that comes in. There's the dismissal of our worldviews. There's the way we have to code switch when we write papers. So all of these are much bigger challenges, I think, that I, I'm not sure how the system has to embrace that we see the world differently. And therefore, we're going to do our work differently but it's a challenge that the systems are going to have to look at. Well said, Cheryl. Um, I can, um, I thank you, Cheryl, for that, for that perspective. I feel a lot of the same things um, as I've attended classes through my academic journey. And it's a hard thing for indigenous students particularly to navigate. Um, I also agree that I think UBC as an institution is letting its students, Indigenous uh, students down um, in regards to classroom safety and cultural safety in classrooms. I think that's a huge, a, a huge uh, thing that's lacking right now. I, I, specifically, I can speak to, uh, I can't speak to my experience. I'm not a grad student, but as a professional student, um, UBC just instituted last year uh, a mandatory Indigenous content class for the incoming law students. So every first year law student has to take a class called Indigenous Settler Legal Relations. Um, and while the intentions and the work behind that uh, class was, you know, um, am amazing. And I think that in terms of its, you know, UBC stepping up to its um, calls to action within the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, that Allard took that very seriously and they worked on that swiftly and I, I'm really happy to see that they tried. However, I think that they failed students, Indigenous students particularly with a class like that, where they force um, non-Indigenous students who don't care about Indigenous content and, you know, when we have to sit and relearn our trauma through uh, a settler lens and a colonial lens, it's very detrimental. Um, and I also, I, I feel that, um, that they didn't prepare professors to, to to, to cut the conversation off when it got dangerous and it got harmful. There was a lot of racist comments, a lot of really dangerous and harmful narratives that were carried in the class um, where Indigenous students had to sacrifice our learning and turn ourselves off and leave the room and not go to class um, so that non-Indigenous students can learn about residential schools and, and ask really inappropriate questions and you know push stereotypes of us that don't exist. 
um, and that shouldn't be pushed in a classroom setting when we pay to go to school and we're also there to learn. Um, I feel that uh, UBC really let us down this year um, in terms of Indigenous content in classrooms and um, that we had nowhere to really turn to and professors didn't like to hear what we had to say and, and students didn't really like to hear it either. So I think when it came down to the, the class winding up, I was left with this idea of why is UBC um, sacrificing Indigenous safety and Indigenous well-being in a classroom so that non-Indigenous students can learn? Um, those things shouldn't be comparable and I don't think that we should be forced to give up our safety in a classroom to allow other people to to learn about things that are highly sensitive but impact us in in a very great way and a lot of us walk with those experiences from our parents and our grandparents um, and I and I move forward thinking about how UBC as an institution can do better at at managing um, and managing those situations and making sure that Indigenous students shouldn't be sacrificing so that other people can can benefit. Baruka, sorry, you can go ahead, Tavena. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, I was just really sitting here reflecting with Cheryl and Baruka's comments and how much I relate to every everything you said, and um, and it, you know, and it is especially what you mentioned, Baruka, about um our parents and our grandparents like um you know i'm a i'm the last generation of a 60 scoop survivor you know removed from my family's home from 1985 to 1991 when it ended and my mother was also a 60 scoop survivor and then there's my grandfather and he went to residential school and ran away uh from residential school so you know it's not in the past it's it's hap it's now like i still have these experiences in my family when i'm talking about well-being um i'm talking about the well-being of my family and my community and we are we're not yet well some of us are but we're on different different journeys at different times and um so for me i bring that into the classroom wherever i go and that it, that informs my learning and my desire to learn um I think for me, I just wanted to kind of maybe offer an analogy that kind of um, branches off of what Melissa was sharing when she was um, opening and talking about the charter about um, changing the pond. Um, if you've heard this analogy, you know, uh, you know, three frogs on a log and one of those frogs decides that they're going to jump off into the pond. How many frogs are on the log? Well, there's still three because the frog only made the decision to jump off the log, didn't take the action of jumping. So I think for me, um, when we're talking about well-being and especially uh, safety in the classroom, um, you know, who 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 has that honest view? You can you can see that there's a problem. You might think there's a problem. You you're not going to necessarily feel that there's a problem as much as I might. Um, but are you going to stay sitting on that log just with um, awareness that there's a problem? Or are you going to jump into the pond and try to do something about it? So I think that's, for me, the biggest challenge is just the acknowledgement or the realization of the truth and where we're at right now. Um, you know, it's one thing for an institution to make statements. It's another thing to see things follow through with actions. And, um, and like what Veruca was saying about um you know at our expense non-indigenous students are learning i don't necessarily think that we need to stop those conversations from happening but there needs to be something in place um to protect the students that like myself i come to the classroom with complex ptsd so if we're talking about these things it it brings up these resentments of uh, these institutional resentments that i carry and i work on letting go every single day you know, the word resentment is about re-feeling something over and over again. And that is my experience going into the classroom and trying to engage in these dialogues. Um, you know, there's no trigger warnings, content warnings. You know, it's, you don't have to show us visuals for there to be in need of a, a trigger warning. Am I going to get reprimanded if I leave the classroom because I don't want to participate in this conversation? Um, you know, uh, so I think, um, yeah, I think it, it 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 starts with the institution making the commitments, but then there's the people that push forward the movements or or the um, actions, and um, you know until those things happen, 
you know, in all levels, I don't think there's going to be a shift in the classroom. Students come to the classroom with certain implicit biases that they've carried from their upbringing and from society's uh, norms and, and uh, what they believe is true. And, um, and so they don't quite, they might think, oh yeah, there's a problem. Someone told me there's a problem in the classrooms, but they're not necessarily feeling it the way someone like myself or the other panels panelists are feeling it because we have lived experience and it's not in the past it's it's now it's affected my entire education um, and still does today so um, yeah I think just acknowledging being honest and, and truthful you know that there is a problem um, and taking that action taking that jump off the log um, maybe we'll build a little bit of trust and we can go somewhere from there Yeah, sure. Sorry, I, yeah. I, I've had a just reflecting on what's been said and you know, we're all we've all had very similar experiences and and trauma in the classroom is real. And one thing that I think systemically that could be addressed is why are professors who have no interest in indigenous teachings, why are professors who have no interest in indigenous realities? being asked to teach these classes without first being trained to teach these classes. And one of my arguments, and I've had this at SFU a few times around a few different tables is, we would never allow a professor to get their hands on an expensive piece of equipment without first making them go train for it. You don't get a new microscope in your lab without learning how to use it. You don't get you know, a telescope in your physics department without learning how to use it, yet somehow it's acceptable for professors to, to approach Indigenous education and Indigenous lives and Indigenous realities without any training at all. And I think that that's one of the biggest challenges. If they absolutely don't care, maybe we better look at who we're hiring. And if they do care and they're just not equipped, then why aren't our institutions training them better? Thanks. I completely echo what all of you have said and it's not yeah the professors are an issue and another issue are is the students because especially due to being online there has been issues where indigenous students have spoken out about issues or um, recounting traumas and non-indigenous students have spoken over them and attempt to i guess say for instance that although this happened, another thing matters more, or although this happened, we have to pay attention to this issue instead. And it really creates, I guess, an, as you guys have all said, an unsafe space where Indigenous students don't feel comfortable sharing these experiences or talking about Indigenous issues. And this also acts as a, outside the classroom where Indigenous students don't feel safe in social settings in the university. Because another reason why a lot of students come to institutions like UBC is so they can have the social experience, so they can network, so they can like um, make connections and meet new people. And so this just makes the indigenous, not just the indigenous experience at UBC, but the students experience at, UB at UBC and other institutions a lot more challenging. For example, there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of conversations whether indigenous students have, whether they pay tuition. And a lot of non-indigenous students get surprised when I tell them that I pay tuition just as much as an like as a non-indigenous student. So these conversations are super important. We need to figure out what is the best way to respond to when these things happen. I just want to branch off what you said there, Yasmin, because it reminded me of an experience I had in um, my first year of undergrad at Vancouver Island University. I don't know if it's changed since then, but um, it, you know, it took me three years of applying to my band for funding um, because I am not fresh out of high school. I'm not living on my reserve. I don't live in the province. Um, so I was a mature student out of province off reserve and so I was at the bottom in terms of priority funding and so it took me three continuous years of applying and um, <clears throat> excuse me I did get the funding and so at the beginning of the term and I had to go to the bookstore and get all my books um, there's a lineup for paying and then there's a lineup for sponsored students and at the beginning of the term, those line, the lineup is massive to, to get your textbook, but there was nobody in the lineup for the sponsored student. So I'm standing there with my stack of books and having to walk past this huge lineup of students who are 
resentful that I'm sponsored and, you know, making all these assumptions about me and, uh, you know, and I have to stand there and be in that line and, and just um, be kind of put out there like that. So, yeah, there's a misconception that everybody gets funding because you're First Nation. That's not true. It depends on your band and your band's funding and what they can afford. And a lot of students aren't, you know, and then you get into the, the masters and the PhDs and some bands would much rather fund more undergrads and whatnot. So I'm in that current challenge. But um, yeah, and these are just systemic barriers that aren't thought about. And we have to go through that experience. And, um, and it separates us socially from our peers. And I agree, I think it's really important. I'm an experiential learner. I learn by seeing, by doing, by spending time with people. And if there's a distance between us because of these, um, you know, systemic uh, challenges outside of the classroom and inside of the classroom, then it, it, it it's very isolating, you know? I don't even know what I'm doing here. You guys should be running this. Okay, so, um, so good, so smart. Uh, so higher education institutions, they are, uh, they're trying to get, uh, wellness, wellness going. How how do we center indigenous values, worldview, experiences, identity, in an institutional well-being plan, policy rollout? What are what are some takeaways that that uh, that our five hundred influencers uh, watching today can can take away today? I think. Um my my understanding of this and my working in the university has led me to this conclusion is that there's not enough indigenous people at the at the decision making tables and people to give their input um, when things really matter i know that ubc just had a budget rollout and i know that indigenous peoples weren't consulted in that um, and i think that at every stage of planning of engagement um, of advising even budgets and finances um, there needs to be indigenous people there guiding the way and being able to be consulted. And I think that a, a critical point on this is that one indigenous person does not equal consultation. And I've seen this time and time again uh, within UBC is how um, it's really easy to talk to one indigenous person. And I've worked on projects where that they've tried to make that one person me um, and that's not enough. Um, indigenous peoples walk this earth in many different ways and we come from many different places. Um, and one perspective is not enough and it's not going to be representative of the whole student body. I know that UBC is a very diverse campus as, as I'm sure is Waterloo and SFU and um, all these different campuses embody more than one Indigenous experience. And my question, um, whenever I see uh, plans roll out and strategic planning and um, financial budgets and uh, who, who was there to guide that process and who was there to be able to to say that Indigenous peoples saw those things before they came out and an important part of, of engagement and of consultation is don't come, in, don't come to Indigenous peoples at the end with the whole plan. That's not consultation. That's a stamp of approval and that's not that does not equate to consultation. Um, Indigenous peoples need to be there from the start and they need to be uh, consulted and we need to be working alongside our non-Indigenous peers and colleagues throughout the entire process. It's not a an end stamp of approval. And I think that universities and particularly UBC, what I can speak to, um, needs to be better at having Indigenous peoples um, in every step of the process. Veruca, I absolutely agree and echo everything you just said. I think that one of the challenges that universities have to prepare for is the reality that to do things in an Indigenous manner takes more time. This idea of these colonial imposed timelines are unrealistic because we need to consult community. We can't be individual voices. And I agree with you, that's one of the biggest challenges is this idea of what is, counts as consultation from these colonial institutional perspectives. Don't marry with what counts as consultation from an Indigenous worldview. And time has to be built into these schedules. I know that when SFU first struck up its Reconciliation Council, it gave them a timeline that the council quickly went back and doubled. Like that was the, their first act was to double the timeline because it takes time. And not just the communities within the university who obviously need to be consulted, but the communities for whose land the institutions sit on 
need to be brought in and consulted and in real ways from the beginning, not from the end of that point. So th those are my thoughts as well. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think for myself, um, I've seen this in so many different workplaces. There's a big gap for me between my undergrad and my master's now almost 10 years. And, um, um, and it's the same no matter where I go in terms of workplaces or institutions. Um, there's a rush to get things done, to look good, um, to kind of follow this trend of uh, reconciliation. Well, what does that even mean to people? Um, you know, and I echo everything about consultation and where are your feet on the ground? What, whose lands are these? And start there. And um, and kind of grow from there, and 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 try to get representation of the different voices that you're um, trying to support. Um, but another big thing that I always advocate for is um, I don't see many people doing a big assessment of their culture, you know, of their of their organizational culture, whether it be in the institution um, or in a workplace, um, as a starting point, just to see not just what Indigenous people think and feel, but what everybody thinks and feels about the situation. You know, if we don't really know where we are and what's around us, how can we move forward from that? So, um, you know, a, a lot of folks kind of just skip those first early steps. And that's, I, I, again, to Cheryl's point about time, it takes a lot of time to get the voices of everybody and how they're feeling and and what they think is important and the experiences they're having, whether they're Indigenous or not, I think are all very valid um, because we can't do this siloed. It's, it, you know, we have to do it together. So, um, yeah. I echo what all you guys have said and it's all super important. And another thing I would like to note is that if, if there is, I guess, more centering Indigenous wellness, Indigenous worldviews, and Indigenous voicing. It more so happens in courses that are related to the arts. So more of Indigenous studies, sociology, poli-sci, anthropology, and all those other areas. However, and there's less so in courses like STEM. And this really creates an issue where it's more unsafe. There's less, less cautious decision-making for Indigenous students, especially because, so as a research assistant, I had to look through all the different faculty, Indigenous faculty in all the in all the different um, areas on campus, and there's fewer Indigenous professors, staff, and whatnot, and Indigenous involvement in STEM than there are in sorry in psychology, in Indigenous studies, in anthropology, and all those other fields. And so, what we also need to do is really try to aim to improve Indigenous worldviews and, and really integrate Indigenous worldviews, wellness, and whatnot in STEM. Well said, team. Um, kind of feels like we're on the same team today. Uh, so he, last question, and uh, it's a barn burner. Um, if we are going to, uh, if we're going to make a big difference and you're going to recommend higher education to the next generation, what do we need to do right now? You, you all get one response on this because we're kind of coming up to the end here. I'll go first. As a mother who has children in post-secondary now, uh, my recommendation has been from the start to surround themselves with a network of trustworthy Indigenous supports to, to walk them through any challenges because somebody at their institution has walked that road. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. We have a large community of support and that's what they should be accessing. Um, yeah, as a parent as well, I echo that. And I feel that um, my, my, one, my one piece of advice and one thing that I wanna see now is, is how staff, university staff are being intentional um, with their actions um, and how that they, uh, understanding that every action has a consequence and being intentional with what we want our consequences, positive or negative to be as we move forward, um, moving towards reconciliation. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just jumping in. Um, so yeah, I feel so looking forward, wellness or well being, you know, it needs to be inclusive, it needs to be equitable, um, it needs to be empowering. 
and you know, and even liberating of of us folks, so that um, there are no barriers to our well being. It doesn't stop when we leave our house and go to the institution. That we can be our whole selves. Whether you know, for myself, I'm woman, I'm two spirit, I'm indigenous. There's a lot of intersectionalities going on there. I have a young son. I had him as a teen you know, and, um, and those were a lot of challenges that I faced um, trying to go back to school and provide for him. And so I want my experience to be a positive one so that it inspires him to maybe go to university. And so far, I'm not so sure he's interested in going to university based on my experience. So, you know, and the decisions that are being made, you know, is it transparent? Is, is the information accessible to the public or to students, you know? data, how policies are made, um, just the resources. Is it, is it a don't ask, don't tell approach? Or is it that you're trying to share this information so that we can actually access it in a way that we can act like that we can actually hear it? Um, not all of us are online, you know, and, um, and just kind of going on the theme of Indigenous parenthood as a student. Um, is that you know is that thought of you know that i remember i wanted to go and do a overseas exchange for a term and i had child care all set up and whatnot and it, it's not really geared for indigenous parents so you know i didn't get to have that experience so that's why i'm talking about equitable and inclusive um the power dynamics you know are the decision makers representative of, of the collective i mean you know it's, it has to start at that point otherwise um it's not going to go anywhere um and you know i think there's a lot that we can do one institution to another learn by seeing and doing and bridge those gaps as opposed to competing with one another because at the end of the day it's student first right and we're here to learn um and um so we can put those egos aside and hopefully learn from one another and um and move forward in a good way but yeah, it does start with us. We have to be well first as individuals. So thank you. So this is a bit tricky, but maybe one thing that we could really, I would really love to see in more um, higher education institutions is more indigenous role models, like more um, visibility of indigenous role models, especially when you're like 18, 19. I remember when I was that age and coming into UBC, there's so much information coming at you. You barely know how to choose your own courses. You don't know what wellness options there are for you. So it'd be great to see more indigenous role models talking about um, wellness at, at each institution and talking from different faculties. For example, as going back and talking about STEM, and, in STEM, there's a lot, there's significantly less indigenous visibility. And when you're going to class every day and seeing people who don't look like you, it really takes a toll on your well on your wellness. So go and it's really hard to implement indigenous worldviews in a course like astrophysics. So it'd be really great if we could see more indigenous, um, indigenous role models, indigenous faculty, indigenous student leaders in, I guess, in air in areas where there are fewer indigenous students. And to see those Indigenous students thriving is really, really important. Well, this has been phenomenal. It's been the best uh, 35 minutes of my day so far. Uh, so I do want a massive thanks to the panel. Uh, give them some love, participants. They, uh, they, they spewed truth there for quite a bit. It was that was awesome. You don't get that very. Very awesome. And so uh, I guess it's our job now not to decide to jump off the log, but to jump off the log. Uh, so it's time to time to get moving. I do want to I do want to hand over uh, the Zoom mic over to Dr. Lightfoot. Um, and uh, the her bio, Dr. Lightfoot's bio is available in um, in the speaker's package. Dr. Lightfoot, it seems like your sounds are not on. You're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? 
Yes, thank yes. you. Okay, I just uh, took out the AirPods. We'll try again. Um, I want to uh, thank you, uh, Mark, for the handover. And I want to especially acknowledge um, all the student voices that we just heard uh, the conversation. Um, incredibly rich and I just uh, want to tell you that uh, we hear you and uh, we take each and every one of uh, your points and comments uh, both about uh, the highlights of what we're doing well as post-secondaries but especially uh, the challenges. Um, I think we all need to uh, stay attentive to how students are feeling and thinking and stay in a constant conversation about that. And that's how we can, over time, move the needle forward. So um, I am joining you this morning from UBC's campus. Uh, so that's the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And I want to thank them as always for their support of our campuses, our programs. I see and we at UBC see uh, amongst Indigenous leadership that we are uh, advancing Indigenous well-being in uh, particular ways. And uh, go ahead and uh, take the next slide, please. So just, uh, I, I know my bio's in the packet, but just in the way of uh, properly introducing myself to you, I am Anishinaabe. I'm from the Lake Superior Band of Ojibwe, and I my community is from the south side of Lake Superior, although my nation is uh, quite substantial, covering uh, a huge territory across the states of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, and a massive uh, part of Ontario. Go ahead and take us to the next slide, please. So, Okay, I'm getting uh, messages that my internet is struggling. Am I coming through? Okay, I will, uh, I will proceed. Thanks so much. Um, what I'm hoping to do in my time today is just touch on three main points. And I'd like to, first of all, take us just a, a bit back so that we can understand the origins and the background of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And I wanna take a very high level, very quick history in order to emphasize that it is uh, both a collective and an individual human rights document. And it's extremely important to understand this background um, so that we stay true to the first desires of the grassroots indigenous peoples and movements that brought forward these principles and advocated for everything that would eventually become the UN Declaration that we have today. And then we want to look at uh, secondly, what the declaration is and what implementation means in the context of Indigenous well-being. It is a holistic articulation of Indigenous well-being, and I'm reflecting here on some of the words from the students that I heard just a few minutes ago about holistic visions of well-being, the mental, the physical, the spiritual, all coming together. And that's what this declaration is. And it's also, uh, and just as importantly, I think a guide of what good relations should include between indigenous and non-indigenous sectors of society. And most importantly, as the UN itself states, this document is a universal framework of minimum standards for the survival, dignity, and well-being of Indigenous peoples of the world. And then we'll switch briefly uh, in the last few minutes to look at the UBC context and discuss how we, were, how we are attempting to advance the UN Declaration through the Indigenous Strategic Plan uh, to help advance well-being in our particular context. Please go ahead and advance the slide. 
So if we step way back um, to take a very quick look at human rights instruments uh, that and standards that existed as of the late 1960s, when indigenous advocacy really got off the ground uh, in Canada and other parts of the world more or less simultaneously. And what we saw at that stage was that anti-discrimination provisions were dominant. And unfortunately for indigenous peoples began moving uh, political thought and discussion in a direction that would ultimately attempt to terminate indigenous peoples, indigenous lands and indigenous status as it was at that time being interpreted by the dominant society as discriminatory practices. And indigenous people's response uh, back in the late 1960s and forward was to assert that they're not a race in the same way as other people are seen or a minority, but are actually peoples recognized with rights and title and treaties, and most importantly, the right of self-determination. And all of these human rights covenants were declaring that all peoples of the world had an equal right to self-determination and the right to determine their political status, pursue their own visions of development and well-being. And indigenous peoples began to ask, if all peoples have these rights, why not us? Why are we excluded? Why are we being discriminated and marginalized within the human rights framework? Next slide, please. So by the mid 1970s, indigenous groups, both on the north side and the south side of the border began to meet in council, meet in discussion and sat around and talked about uh, between elders and knowledge keepers and youth and women and all the groups that gathered uh, what their vision of indigenous rights, indigenous human rights would be. Now let's remember that in the mid 1970s, the people who at that time were our elders were often the children of those who had signed treaties in the late 19th century in many parts of the continent. That's how close we are uh, in generational time to those times. And those elders and, and community groups discussed together uh, in, in council and in a consensus form of discussion, what the future should look like and, and how indigenous people's well-being could be possibly articulated through a Western legal language of rights and what the nature of indigenous and non-indigenous relationships should look like. And each of these groups, the, the International Indian Treaty Council on the south side of the border and the World Council of Indigenous Peoples on the north side of the border, each produced in these meetings in the mid 1970s, a declaration of principles. Go ahead and advance the slide, please. And from those mid 1970s documents, 40 years later, those declaration of principle documents eventually uh, through much conversation became what we now know as the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. But it took more than 20 years of discussions and negotiation between Indigenous advocates, many of whom had sat in council in the 1970s meetings at Standing Rock and Port Alberni and had brought their declarations of principles to the UN in Geneva and sat and negotiated with UN member states for those full 20 years. And still, even after all of those years, what was the final UN declaration bears an incredibly strong resemblance to those very early declarations of principles. And while it's now all written in human rights legal language, it still, for the most part, reflects the essence of what those elders in the 1970s told us was the pathway to Indigenous peoples' individual and collective well being. Please advance the slide. A few important points to note about the UN Declaration. It is an articulation, both individually and collectively, of what Indigenous well being should be. It's a global consensus. It was 
developed and advocated for by Indigenous peoples representatives, and I should say defended uh, by Indigenous advocates and representatives, because over those 20 years, the nation states of the world tried every trick uh, that they could think of in order to undermine, minimize, and belittle these rights expressions. So the 20 years of discussions was largely a defensive exercise in order to keep intact those original declaration of principles. The amended version, uh, slightly amended version, eventually passed the UN General Assembly in 2007 and is what we see before us now as the UN Declaration. Next slide, please. In my own work, in my own vision, I see the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as not just another human rights document. It's different, it's distinctive. And the reason for that is that it engages in a serious set of global challenges, global changes. It respects and recognizes and supports the collective rights of Indigenous peoples in a way that no other human rights document has done to date. It officially corrects and helps us work toward the correction of all of the discriminatory legal exclusions that Indigenous people have suffered and that have enabled colonization and have enabled the lack of well being and, and the compromised well being that we see in so many Indigenous communities. It helps us with a new guiding framework for what Indigenous state relations and Indigenous non Indigenous relationships should look like in best practice. And it centers Indigenous people's practices in global politics in a way that is very seldom recognized and yet is extremely important, I think, in, in terms of modeling positive behavior on the global stage. Next slide, please. The UN Declaration, of course, is uh, a complex legal document now with a preamble and 46 articles, but we can uh, as a, understand it as well as a human to human document about getting relations right. And even though the instrument itself is primarily directed at nation states, it's important for us to understand the UN Declaration as a framework for meaningful reconciliation and action at all layers of society. And I wanna remind us here that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada in 2015 called the UN Declaration the framework for reconciliation in this country for a reason. They intended it to be the guidebook, the guiding framework for how to advance the UN Declaration in our day-to-day -day life. And we can all take these to heart and action these in our day-to-day -day interactions and work acknowledging Indigenous self-determination, creating an atmosphere of mutual respect, engaging in reciprocity, centering collaboration, co-development and co-governance as our approaches, and of course, keeping our relationships grounded in ongoing discussion, negotiation, and good relations. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Switching now to the UBC, context, uh, we have had actually uh, indigenous strategic framework, we called it the Aboriginal strategic plan uh, in existence at UBC since 2009. And um, during those years from 2009 to 2020, we did see some important shifts uh, in programming and some addition of some, some wonderful programs, especially for students. We've seen advancements in indigenous faculty. But since then, uh, again, with the UN Declaration, the TRC calls, and then the Missing Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry, we've had some philosophical shifts. And we began to develop uh, an updated Indigenous strategic framework that we developed from 2017 through uh, its launch in 2020. And that built on, in most respects, the UBC Okanagan's Declaration of Truth and Reconciliation Commitments that were launched in 2019. Next slide, please. And when we set about the, the new Indigenous strategic planning process, 
we wanted um, to respond to some voices that were expressing some of the challenges that still existed after nearly 10 years of the first Aboriginal strategic plan. We heard some of the, the issues reflected in what the students told us on the panel just ahead of me. Classrooms are not always safe for Indigenous students. There are not enough Indigenous peoples at the decision-making table. The one Indigenous person does not equal consultation and that Indigenous peoples cannot just be brought in at the end, that it takes more time to do things right, and that we must build in Indigenous-specific worldviews into strategic plans and the implementation of strategic plans. So on this graphic, um, which you can actually take a look at on the website at indigenous.ubc.ca, uh, along with uh, much more information about how we developed uh, this Indigenous strategic strategic plan. Uh, we uh, engaged all communities at UBC, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, students, faculty, staff. We engaged in person. We engaged with an online survey. And we met with deans and executives. We created um, ad hoc committees to guide particular parts of the planning process. All of this was Indigenous-led and centered Indigenous voices. All in all, more than 2,500 people engaged in these two rounds of engagement sessions on developing the plan. And we gathered more than 15,000 individual ideas, opinions, and comments. Please advance the slide. After the launch of the plan in September 2020, uh, we also began looking at how to guide the implementation so that all of these points about consultation, engagement, and Indigenous people at the decision-making table could begin to be rectified and that we could establish an implementation model that would support uh, overcoming some of these historical challenges in post-secondaries. So we developed um, a network structure for ISP implementation support. We have launched several new Indigenous-led advisory and implementation committees, and we place now Indigenous peoples from across both campuses at decision-making tables for the first time ever. So hopefully we will not um, continue to have decisions taken at this institution without engaging Indigenous peoples early, in the middle, and at the end stage of programming decisions, budgeting decisions, and other processes. We've um, developed this with an eye towards a, a human rights-based and Indigenous human rights-based model. We have tried to reverse the usual plan uh, because another thing that we heard was that Indigenous peoples are overburdened with work uh, on advancing Indigenous engagement. So we wanted to flip that around and say, actually, the, the bulk of responsibility for implementing the Indigenous Strategic Plan at UBC involves non-Indigenous peoples and involves non-Indigenous units taking uh, responsibility and accountability for advancing the ISP. And so we've charged each unit, faculty, and portfolio with advancing and aligning the ISP in their own way. And then each faculty and portfolio and unit will also be evaluated on their own plan's success. So amplifying Indigenous voices throughout the university is a critical element of implementation and ensuring that we are centering Indigenous experiences in what is actually quite an innovative structural change process. And to avoid further harm, we are always focusing on slowing down progress, slowing down colonial timelines, situating ourselves within a colonial institution and doing the work in the right way to advance Indigenous people's well-being by building reciprocal relationships both within and outside UBC. So I think my last slide is just to say, Chimi Gwich, I thank you for giving me some minutes today to share about how I see the UN Declaration as a pathway to Indigenous well-being, 
where it comes from, why I see it as so critical, and then also how uh, we hope to make that the foundation for the next stage of Indigenous engagement and well being at the University of British Columbia. So, with that, I would like to turn over and pass over the mic to Kathleen Leahy, Director of UBC's Learning Exchange. Thank you very much, Cheryl. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, I really want to acknowledge the nice lead in that you've just provided me. So thank you. Um, and I want to just acknowledge the powerful lessons being shared today. We are a little bit behind, so I'm going to do my best to catch up and thank you very much for the first slide. So I'm here to offer some concrete examples of how the University of British Columbia's learning exchange uh, has been doing some of this work. And I also want to just acknowledge and coming to you from my home in Vancouver's downtown from the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And I'm very grateful for the privilege and honor of being able to talk with you today. Um, I also wanna just mention, I can't take credit for a lot of what I'm sharing. It's based on the work of the entire learning exchange team. Many of the students that have worked with us, uh, our community volunteers, the elders that we've worked closely with, in particular Doris Fox and Wendell Williams, uh, with students who've joined us to learn with us and Indigenous people from both the downtown Eastside community, which I'll be talking to mostly, and the UBC community. I'd also like to acknowledge that myself as a settler and the entire learning exchange team has been on a journey for, I would say, a good 12 years to learn about how to bring Indigenous worldviews, perspectives, practices, and um, which there are many, uh, into our work. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the downtown east side context in a moment. Um, so in terms of how I'm going to proceed with my, my presentation is just give you some examples of how we're working towards uh, that work. But first, give you some context, talk a bit about the community and place in which we're situated, and then go through some of those examples. I hope you're okay with my choice to um, use PowerPoint. It's partly to keep me on track because there's so much multi-layeredness to our work, but I also think the visuals will give you a little bit more of the story that is hard for me to embody given some of this work is not work that I've actually always been directly involved in as a director. So next slide, please. So um, I think it's probably known to everyone, but in case you don't know, UBC is a research intensive university. And it, I think it's important to mention that so you understand that research is highly valued at our institution. Uh, and so then when we think about what is the learning exchange, uh, you know, we're a community university engagement initiative that's place based. We're in Vancouver's downtown east side, and there's three interrelated areas of our work. First of all, is the very important um, foundation on which everything else we do um, is built. And that's the free community educational programs that we offer on site. We're 19 kilometers away from the Vancouver campus. So we're not only physically distant, we can sometimes um, feel psychologically distant as well. Um, and part of our, the second part of our work is we provide learning opportunities for students, experiential learning, uh, hands-on learning. We also support community-based research and knowledge exchange, which is more recent. Uh, we were very hesitant to do that work for many years due to um, some of the, the challenges that research has presented to the downtown east side community and the fact that it has been often seen as is a dirty word. As their name suggests, we focus on two-way or multi-directional learning exchanges, which is at the heart of our work. Our actions are also guided by important principles, and Heather Holroyd on my team is going to pop some of those into the chat. Um, our work is predicated on the asset-based community development approach to works. So we really try to focus on strengths within the community. And then I'll call out one principle in particular that informs our work. It's celebration. We recognize that it takes courage to overcome the risks of learning. We celebrate and support every step, large or small, that leads to greater awareness, understanding, and action. And so of the six principles, that's the one that I think really fits well today with the conversation we're having. Uh, I, we really find that learner-based relationships is a really important way to think about our work and to do our work. 
So we're not just building community capacity, we're really building uh, university capacity to work together to respond to some of the community identified needs that the down, downtown east side has shared with us. So we're really in that broker role, we're a neutral convener, which often means we're trying to demystify the community to the university and vice versa. And often this takes the form of just practical advice on how to engage with each other, which we're always continually learning. Um, we're never arrived. It's always about promising practices. I really don't like the term best practices because we're always learning. And I'll just mention last year was our 20th anniversary. So we have been doing some of this work for a while. Could you please advance to the next slide? So what exactly happens at the learning exchange? I, I'm putting, I've put up some metrics here just because I think it's important for people to understand the breadth and scope of the work that we do. I think the conversation circle really emphasized a lot of the ideas for students um, that we need to pay more attention to. So thank you to, for, to everyone for that. Um, so I'm not gonna spend much time talking about what we're doing with students. I'm really gonna focus on the work we've done in recent years to offer social arts and cultural activities as one way to promote health and well-being through an indigenous lens. So you can see sort of some of the volume of, what, of the relationships we have, and this is how we've arrived at some of our learnings. Next slide, please. So the very, um, I think the third piece of very important context is the downtown Eastside community context. Since time immemorial, the land that is now known as the downtown Eastside has constituted part of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil tooth territories. The downtown Eastside, like many other neighborhoods has experienced significant change. However, the downtown Eastside continues to be a hub for indigenous organizations, services and cultural organizations with roughly 10% of the population identifying as Indigenous as compared to 2% for Vancouver overall. Uh, people from all over uh, Canada come to the downtown east side. It's known as a strong community of resilience. It has a history of social activism, has a high number of artists, including Indigenous artists, knowledge keepers, and cultural groups like West Coast Night at the Aboriginal Friendship Centre and Portland Hotel Society's Culture Saves Lives, these are two really great examples. Many people, including people at the university, see the downtown east side, however, as a place of hopelessness because they don't really know about the good things going on in the community. They just look at the media and they don't have any direct relationship or understanding of the lived experience of many who call the downtown east side home. Over the years, i um, worked in the downtown east side for 25 years and people often have told me Yes, there are challenges, but it's also the place where they feel the most acceptance and a sense of community. So if you're not familiar with the downtown east side, I really encourage you to find out more and I'm happy to support that in any way as well. Next slide, please. So how do we define health and well-being in our work? It, in our work, it's really our starting point has always been to work to change the discourse about the downtown east side as a place of hopelessness. Our objectives are to inspire, lead, and support people living and working in the downtown east side and students, faculty, and staff at UBC to work together to change the way we talk and act in the community. So when we think about health, we really talk about, it's more than just the physical health, which we've been talking about all morning, of course, and that's an indigenous worldview, but it's also in the context of the downtown east side, it means having stability, a place to live, a sense of being cared for, and being able to care for others and having the means to do that and a sense of belonging to a whole number of communities but also a very strong cultural community and it's a chance to be stimulated and a chance to learn what might be less obvious is through the course of our work we've discovered that these same elements are really important uh, for promoting health among students faculty staff who connect with our programming um, we're always seeing that the university community is very touched by the work that happens and they learn in a very different way when they get involved with us. So I think the last point I want to make about that is we deliberately focus on team wellness at the learning exchange because we find that working in the downtown east side is not only very inspiring but it's also challenging and so having a healthy work environment is extremely vital. Next slide please. So the rest of my talk is really going to be focusing on the journey that we've been through. And in the early part of the journey, it was really 
for us, which it began about eight years ago, I'll, I'll highlight two things that happened. The first is regarding a house post that was carved by Cowichan Master Carver Simon Charlie, which was gifted to UBC in 2010. After some consideration, it was decided that it would be installed at the learning exchange. However, we were quite nervous about the protocols given the history of appropriation, given the place that we were in. However, after consulting community and talking um, to folks, we found out that if we had the right ceremony, that people would really appreciate having the house post. So the house post was installed in 2010 and many people told us they felt more welcome because it showed the value we were playing, placing on indigenous people and also the importance of their contributions. This development let us know that if we tried to do things in a good way, we could do more. So this was very symbolic and very encouraging for us because we were quite tentative about it. We also started at that time developing our learner mindset. So really understanding that we knew nothing, that we had a lot to learn, uh, and that many of us were learning firsthand from Indigenous folks who were sharing with us, who were willing to do that, but also doing our own work on our own time, learning uh, from other folks who at the university who were either providing courses or reading books, but really kind of an immersive learning environment for the whole team. Susie O'Shea, our community animator in particular, set out on a journey to learn more about Indigenous culture, history, issues, and at the same time, um, along with students, put in significant effort to develop relationships with Indigenous groups. Her being Irish, kind of who's ex um, really um, experienced the colonial sort of mindset that Ireland has been under, actually kind of really set her up to understand sort of on her own lived experience what that could be like, although very different, that there were some um, relationships there. So we collaborated also at this time for the very first time with a couple of research groups. One was the Aboriginal Women's Intervention Study, which was a study to explore how some cultural practices for healing might be introduced to women who had experienced intimate partner violence. Uh, this was a very risky step for us within the downtown east side context because many people felt that research had been extractive, had been done in ways that were harmful, um, I think, you know, I don't need to probably go into much detail. I'm sure many people uh, understand that. So we found that um, the women who gathered there over two years told us that they felt very safe and it was very uh, inclusive. And so part of that was because it was being led by a wonderful woman named Elder Roberta Price, who was um, leading the healing circles with the women in the study and who graciously agreed to continue to work with us uh, over the, the coming years. She's been working with us for since that time. And at one point, she also agreed to uh, share her journey of healing from Indian residential schools with patrons in our program, many who were Indigenous, who had actually never had the opportunity to have someone share that with them, talk about their experiences, and do that in a very safe way, uh, whereas settlers we were not involved and really tried to give that space. Um, it was healing for both Elder Roberta Price, who, although she had been a witness um, at the commission, had not actually done that. And she has quite a strong connection to the downtown east side and felt that was a really healing moment for her, as well as for the people who were in the circle. Um, at this time, and I'm sorry if I'm speeding through, um, at this time, there were also uh, many other Indigenous-centered activities that we did from taking people to UBC Farm, to the Aboriginal Healing Garden, to making Indigenous medicines, to getting more connected with groups like the Indigenous Women's Artists who asked us to provide a workshop on creating business cards. And then we helped showcase their art. They were really trying to find ways to, to sell their art. Uh, to working with cultural workers like Wendell Williams on making drums and singing. Uh, so this is this early stage, it was really about just exploring and finding out what was working for people, how could we learn more, um, what else could we do? Could you advance the slide, please? So this continued in the next part of our journey. Uh, we expanded our partnerships. We took new risks to deepen our learning and engagement, including participating in the city-led uh, cultural activities during um, the TRC. Through that process, we learned a great deal. 
uh, um, soon after having had the privilege of meeting Elder Doris Fox, who's from Musqueam, to lead a project called Threading Our Stories, a button blanket project. Um, Co-facilitating with Susie O'Shea again, Doris led UBC students and community members to learn about the button blanket tradition, the techniques, the cultural significance. While the blanket was being completed, each person shared what the project meant to them, what they learned and aspects of their cultures and with older ind individuals sharing their intergenerational knowledge. Um, I'm gonna share a few words that Susie has reflected on and has said about the project. Each stitch, each button tells a story of where that person was at that time, what they brought with them, their lived experiences, their histories, their cultures, their assumptions, their dreams, their goals. It allowed people to really open up. When we were around the blanket, we got to learn so much about one another over the weeks. It allowed us the space to be ourselves, not feel intimidated because people weren't looking at you while you sewed. We got to learn from Doris. We got to learn about West Coast culture, histories of residential schools, and how Indigenous people had been treated. People disagreed sometimes about how to approach the positioning of the buttons. Some people wanted them perfectly placed, while, uh, while others wanted more freedom to go outside the lines. The group had to work through that, and Doris taught us the importance of letting people be who they are, uh, letting them bring what they want, wherever they're at and to honor that. There were definitely uncomfortable conversations, but important for everyone to learn and hear. And as Susie ended, she said, this harkens back to the name of the project, Threading Our Stories. So this was a really engaging and impactful process. We didn't know how it was gonna go at the beginning. Doris was amazing. Uh, she really helped us work through this over the two or three years that it evolved. Um, and it, it had many different um, sort of uh, opportunities to talk about that project and be in that project and do that project that we don't have time to get into. But we have created a video and Elder Doris Fox has reflected five years later, speaking to how projects like this can really bring people from diverse backgrounds and experiences together and to help overcome uh, some of the, the, the prejudice that, that people have but also to create that meaningful change. I'm gonna to go to the next slide just because we're a little bit uh, short on time. So this, the latest part of the journey, due to the pandemic, we've continued to partner with the cultural sharing program at the Carnegie Community Center. Um, we've been working with them for a number of years, but in the last year, we really wanted to focus on how we could combine the technical resources at UBC with the expertise of the Carnegie's Indigenous programs. So we have decided that it was really important to figure out how to offer an in-person online arts and cultural programs. So this collaboration uh, had two successful events. One was last year's Downtown Eastside Indigenous National People's Day, and the other was Hearts Beats, which is an annual event we co-created three years ago with the Carnegie that celebrates the shared traditions of Indigenous and Irish drumming, dance, and storytelling. You see Nicole Bird here from Carnegie, is just a wonderful, wonderful woman, and Susie again from the Learning Exchange. Between these events, over a thousand free meals were handed out to local residents, and almost 500 people virtually joined from across the downtown east side, Vancouver, Canada, and beyond. So the artists, musicians, performers, and elders were so pleased to be able to have that kind of connection and to have that culturally informed um, experiences being shared. Next slide, please. So of course the pandemic has interrupted all of our lives and it really, uh, we were learning from not only the research uh, by people like Whiten, but also from people telling us that many urban indigenous people had been reporting that COVID had limited their access to cultural supports and traditional medicines, which were really important in this time to maintain that physical and mental well being. So it became a key priority for us to figure out how to re envision, how to deliver all this programming that we had developed to the online world and to adjust to that new normal. So we were very fortunate to receive both university and community funding for a project we are calling Ayepsoel, 
together, which is the Hulkamine word for more than one person uh, paddling a canoe, healing and wellness in the time of COVID in Vancouver's downtown east side. So that was just funded recently, and the, the project intends to allow us to learn from and support elders through sharing circles, one-to-one -one sessions, and healing circles. An elder speak series is an elder speaker series is planned with Doris Fox again and Elder Mar Dorval Dorvo from the Carnegie Community Center. Um, and this work is not only exciting because of the number of relationships involved but also because it helps us figure out how to pivot to the online world during this difficult time. And we're also realizing that as time goes on, uh, as we hope to resume to the ways we're used to being together, that for those who may not be able to attend cultural activities in the future, that they will be able to benefit from the resources that we create. There are many partners involved. I'm happy to share who they are at any time. And it's the last thing I'll mention about this project that we're excited about is that it will allow staff and elders to be trained on technical training like video storyboarding, filming, editing, using your camera, uh, so that the important ceremonial practices like smudging, cedar brushing, and drumming on accessible platforms like YouTube and Facebook can be available. We advance to the next slide, please. So what's been working for us? What have we learned? And although we still have lots to learn uh, about changing the pond, I love that metaphor, we have learned some important lessons. It takes a careful and dedicated approach to creating a shared safe space. And the work is ongoing. It is slow work, not just in how we talk, but also in how we act. We pay a lot of attention to the physical, uh, mental and emotional needs of our learning community and to the physical space that we are in. Uh, and in order to build and continue to build the relationships of trust that we've, we've built over time, we have to continue to do that because for many folks that we're working with, it's been eroded for so long as we talked about by educational institutions like our university. So we can never forget that as we do this work. I think it goes back to the principle again of celebration um, that we're um, inspired by, that we really do understand it takes courage to do this learning because there's so many risks and there's so many opportunities for us to not do it well. And so that is a, a constant thing that we need to be, be paying attention to. And we need to look at small steps, um, middle kinds of size steps and big steps. We need to do them all. The other Important lesson for us is continuing to approach relationships without an initial ask, uh, operating within this fragile community that we've been working in. We know that um, that's critical. We can't just come with our asks of the community at UBC. The UBC can't just do that. We need to first do the work that the community wants. And over time, we have found that we can then make those asks. Um, and so I see we need to wrap up, but you can see from uh, some of the other points, arts and culture is powerful, it's vital, it's transformative, and it's healing. Many people have talked about that today. Uh, we need to center joy and fun as well, and that concrete and practical things are really important. And I guess, I guess the final thing I wanted to just talk about is that being on the edge of the institution gives us more freedom, enabling us to operate from principles rather than vested interests valuing collaboration over reputation and ensuring a relationship-based approach. So if there's time, you could put up the last slide. I'll pop a couple of resources into the chat. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Kathleen. That's really wonderful. I'd also like to thank all of our speakers for taking the time to share their knowledge, experiences, and expertise with us today, especially our students who gave us such an authentic and courageous dialogue through the conversation circle. We'd also like to make sure that we have, uh, that we take what we've heard today and that we will discuss shortly and we'll translate that into ongoing action. So we can commit to a few things straight away. The first is that we will create a theme around centering Indigenous engagement at the International Health Promotion Conferences Symposium that will be hosted by McGill and taking place in May of 2022 as part of the IUHBE World Conference on Health Promotion. We hope to see you 
there. And we welcome to reporting what we learn at, in that space. And we also would like to hear from you and to get some feedback from you. And we'll report back about this event uh, through and communicate with you about follow-up opportunities. So we do have a little bit of time and we were, are inviting you to, and welcoming you to stay engaged with us. What we would like to share is that we, in fact, are going to move on to a discussion portion today. Uh, so this concludes the webinar portion of our event. And you're going to see in about a second a new Zoom link in the chat that will uh, invite you to or will invite you to join a different series of a small group discussion about today's event. And we want to thank you. And we'll see you soon uh, in, the, in the other space. And Matt Dolph will remain in this webinar for a few minutes to allow you to access the link in the discussion portion of the event. So thank you all and we'll see you in the new space.